marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. If it were not for the grace of God, all of us would be headed for hell. No exceptions. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and we are all sinners saved by grace. Now please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we looked at a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 15. <clears throat> We're doing a series on Sing Unto the Lord, and today is part number 10. There's a lot to say about music in the Bible because, as I have pointed out, one-third of the Old Testament is written in musical poetic form, and most people don't know that. One-third of the Old Testament is prophecy, but one-third is also, and maybe a little bit more than a third, uh, is in musical poetic form because some of the prophetic sections are written in musical poetic form and yet most Christians aren't even aware of that fact. Now we're not going to be able to get back to this study on biblical music until April 30th. <laughs> so I'll try to cover as much as I can because next week, which is the 9th, is a special message for Palm Sunday. The following week is a special message for Resurrection Sunday as well as the sunrise service and breakfast and of course you're all invited to that. The week after that is our Springs Missions Conference with missionaries Gary and Pat Johnson. <laughs> so uh, uh, praise the Lord, there's a five Sunday month, so at least we'll get back to sing unto the Lord uh, on April the 30th, which by the way is also a fifth Sunday special that evening. So you'll want to be with us for the evening service as well. So a quick review of where we concluded on March 19th. We concluded with the point number 11, music and language. What is the music saying across the cultures? And as I pointed out, that is a very important question. We've talked about offering strange fire to the Lord and we applied that principle to music by asking some very pointed questions because music is a universal language. It transcends culture and it communicates something about the culture and context in which the music was developed. You know, yesterday I heard an interesting discussion on the radio by a world famous conductor who sees various colors in different tonal structures and compositions, and who is able to compare various perfumes to different types of music. In fact, he actually has two chemistry laboratories, one in the United States and one in Europe, where he personally mixes perfumes to maximize the sensory perception of music and colors and smell. So just like you can't a smell or can't see the smell of the perfume, it gets around your intellect. Even so, music can get around your intellectual analysis and it can affect your emotions and reach deep into your other senses. So we gave you, if you recall, I hope you recall, <laughs> a few questions so you can begin to get a handle on how to test music. The first, how was this particular music originally used in the culture where it originated? Number two, did those who developed these forms use them to glorify God, or did they use these particular forms to worship demons? In other words, is this form of music what we would call strange fire? And folks, there is music that has been specifically developed for the purpose of worshiping demonic forces. Baal worship music was that way. But we see a lot of music coming out of some of what we call third world cultures that was also used to worship demons. Third, if this particular music did not spring directly out of pagan worship, is it the fruit of that kind of music brought to full bloom? That's a very important question because something may begin in a very simplistic type of form but then be developed later on. And we'll be talking about the development of music and the development of biblical music and how it fits in with scripture in a later message. Four, there are over 300 distinct forms and genre of music that are clearly defined and that have specific elements that set them apart from all other forms of music. So you've got your work cut out for you. There's a lot out there that needs to be studied. I'm going to be giving you some of that, but we can only start by giving principles that come from the Word of God so that you can make your own discernment yourself if you're willing to go to the hard work to do it. So that left us with a question. So how do you know what you can use and what is dangerous to use, keeping in mind doing all for the glory of God, not just being neutral? Now, I gave you uh, two or three weeks ago the example of how in Roman Catholicism, when they penetrate a culture, they take the idols of the culture, dress them up in uh, fancy clothing, and then rechristen them Mary, and then go about worshiping the same idol that the demon worshipers worshiped before, except it's got a new name now. It's got the name of Mary. And of course, that's um, the strange fire type of worship that God prohibits. 
And I asked the question, so what's the difference between taking a pagan musical form that was originally designed to worship the devil, rechristening that form with Christian words? Rock music and all of its forms goes back to demon worship in pagan tribes in Africa, the Far East, and South America. And I've contrasted that with the great music with its fountainhead in the Protestant Reformation, which has transformative power over such evil music that sprang from demon-worshipping tribes. And I gave you a number of different illustrations from missionaries who have been on the field and who taught the Christians who came to Christ that great music, for example, of Bach, and suddenly there was a sweeping revival in those tribes. Reformation theology. The great post-Reformation musicians such as Bach and Handel, who sprang out of that history, affected generations of later musicians and creatively established the highest forms of Baroque musical structures upon which Rococo, classical, and Romantic musical period musicians built. And then after you get after that, you sort of get impressionistic and you come into modern music and we're trying to eat away at the core that was established during the Reformation period. Uh, but that's Satan just reattacking, 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 trying to get rid of that which was uh, truly to the glory of God. So that brought us back full circle to where we started this particular segment of our study, doing all to the glory of God. And remember, this is a very important principle, folks. Remember, we are not the ones who define what is to the glory of God. God defines what is to his glory. For example, you can't say, for the glory of God, I think I'll go over and paint graffiti on the public school building because they deny God and teach evolution. <laughs> For the glory of God, I'm going to go paint graffiti. You might even say, well, show me in the Bible where it says that it's not for the glory of God because in my mind, I'm doing it for the glory of God. People come back to this inner self business. In my mind, it's for the glory of God. And, oh, they might say, show me a verse where it says, thou shalt not paint graffiti on public school buildings. And since there's no prohibition, it's okay, right? Now, I hope that you all recognize the sophomoric and moronic nature of those kinds of arguments, but you hear them all the time. I mean, you run into that stuff out in society by people who don't think all the time. So just as a basic starting point, I think we would all agree that God has established certain principles that relate to that issue of painting graffiti on public school buildings. For example, one, violating the property rights of others, or two, generally not violating secular law since God places human authority over us for an ordered society, exceptions being when the government commands you to disobey the word of God. Three, the fact that we can reach valid biblical conclusions for life decisions and activities without having to have direct commands or prohibitions like thou shalt not paint graffiti on public school buildings. You know, there is no such prohibition in the Bible, but you know there's some principles that deal with that. Number four, the fact that the Bible clearly states both specific things that are for the glory of God and specific things that are not for his glory. And by both deductive and inductive reasoning, as well as by analogy, we can arrive at valid biblical conclusions that give us restrictive categories. I hope you understand what I'm saying. If it's too hard, just raise your hand and I'll try to make it simpler. But what we're trying to say is, you don't have to have a direct prohibition that says, thou shalt not skateboard in front of Bible Presbyterian Church on the steps. But we have a little sign out there that says, don't do it. Why? Well, number one, somebody might get hurt, and we don't want to get sued. And number two, the insurance company doesn't uh, permit it. And number three, it's breaking up the, the slate that's used for the front steps of the church. You know, there are some obvious types of reasons why certain prohibitions are OK, and certain kinds of commands are OK. Like the mother says to her child, go brush your teeth. And the child looks at his mother and says, show me a Bible verse that says, go brush your teeth. <laughs> you get the idea, right? Okay. So, but the Bible does say, children, obey your parents. See? So even if there's not a specific command or a specific prohibition, there are principles that we can see clearly in God's word that direct us in the way in which we should live a godly Christian life. And those principles apply to music too. Or number five, the fact that the example of Jesus and the apostles was to use scripture to defeat their opponents, not to deface the property of the opponents or kill their donkeys to show their displeasure with what the opponents taught. You know, read what the Bible does. How did Jesus handle things like this? 
But the graffiti artist argument is precisely the type of mindless argument that piously floated around when I was in, quote, Christian college. One of my roommates, I had a bunch of cool roommates and I had a bunch of not so cool roommates over the three years that I was in college. One of my roommates was a very pompous know-it-all who went around saying things like, show me in the Bible where it says, thou shalt not smoke. <laughs> when you were in college, did you ever hear anything like that? If you went to a Christian college, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, or if you taught in a Christian school, show me where it says, thou shalt not smoke. Yeah, <laughs> we have a teacher over here who heard that kind of argument. You know, folks, that is so sophomoric, which means wise fool, uh, from the two words uh, in Greek that mean wise and fool. Um, it's a moronic argument. The obvious answer is the Bible is not an exhaustive list of prohibitions. Although there are some essential prohibitions like thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not murder. But God has given us a plethora of clear moral principles upon which to make all the necessary determinations of life like your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and if you defile the temple of God, he will destroy you. Doesn't have to say thou shalt not smoke. It tells you right off the bat, here's a principle that relates to your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit? Does that increase your chances for lung cancer and a shortened life and a shortened ministry? Yes, it sure does. You see, Jesus, uh, Paul says, you are not your own, you're bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. This crazy business about the people who like abortion, they say, well, it's my body. No, no. If you're a Christian, you're bought with a price. Therefore, says the scripture, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's not just in your spirit. It's your body and in your spirit, which are God's. These are clear, distinct principles established by God in his word so that we will know how to order our lives. Do you think that he didn't give us any principles by which to live whereby one-third of the Bible, we cannot interpret it because it's written in poetic musical form. There are biblical principles that we can deal with, and we've dealt with that for, now this will be the 10th week. We've covered an incredible number of different biblical principles that apply when you, when you focus in on them that apply to music as well as everything else in the Christian life. That same silly roommate of mine was one of the leaders of a sit-in. Now back in the 60s, <laughs> I'm dating myself at this point, back in the early 60s. Uh, they had what they called sit-ins. Any of y'all remember the sit-ins? Admitting that, oh yeah, the sit-ins. There were sit-ins all over the country at different universities. Well, one of my silly roommates was the leader of a sit-in to try to force the administration to put a jukebox in the snack center of the student center, in the snack room. Uh, after all, the Bible doesn't prohibit jukeboxes, does it? Anybody know a verse that says, thou shalt not have a, a jukebox on a Christian college campus? There's no such verse, right? <laughs> oh, brother, talk about a profitable way to spend your college career, sitting on the floor of the snack shop whining about a jukebox. You know. Okay, so when we apply the same logic to music, you can see how moronic it is to say, like the graffiti art artist, for the glory of God, I think I'll go and paint my hair green, pull out my drums and electric guitar, and scream into a microphone a modern translation of the Bible set to rock music. For the glory of God. Like the graffiti artist, you might even say, show me in the Bible where it says that's not for the glory of God because in my mind, it, I'm doing it for the glory of God. Since I've personally decided that I'm doing it for his glory, therefore it is for his glory. Folks, that's a non sequitur. Just because you decide something doesn't make it so. Those words that I just gave you there all I did I mean that was the exact same words I gave you a minute ago when we were talking about the graffiti artist I just applied it to music a graffiti artist painting a public school building can use that exact same argument or like the graffiti artist you might say show me a verse where it says thou shalt not paint thy hair tattoo thy bod and scream bible verses unintelligibly into a microphone of 400 decibels and since there's no prohibition it's okay and you can't tell me otherwise okay so let's go back for a minute I hope you understand that this is the reason that I have given you nine weeks of basic Bible principles for discerning right from wrong rather than just giving you a list of composers or a list of approved and prohibited music. And so what does it mean to do all to the glory of God? How do we approach the question when it covers all of life, including music? Where is the first handle that we can grab onto? Now, two weeks ago, I gave you... Um, 
where we just started looking at a hint that Paul gave us in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. In other words, it's not to impress other people. It's not to make money off of other people. It's not to titillate your flesh. It's not to give you the warm fuzzies. You do it as to the Lord and not unto men. You do it with all your heart. In verse 17, he says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the name of Jesus is going to be attached to this. So you better be careful how you use the name of Jesus so that you don't blasphemously use the name of Jesus for something he doesn't approve. It's a very important principle. Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So the two key elements. First, do it enthusiastically with all your heart. No room for dragging your feet when you're doing something for the glory of God. Second, clarify your focus. Keep Jesus Christ in the center, not how you feel about it in the center. Too many people, when they think about music, they say, well, how do I feel about it? That's not the center. Jesus Christ must be the center. Fade out the question, what will other people think? Or what's this doing for me? Fade those questions out. You're glorifying the Lord and you're doing it for him alone. So don't try to play spiritual politics by balancing part of your constituency against the other part, like balancing God's standards against the standards of man and hoping that somehow you're going to end up pleasing both of them. You can't do it. Do everything as to the Lord and not unto men. Remember, I told you when I was a teenager, I made a resolution that I don't care what other people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks. You know, if you really practice that, that will focus you. That will narrow your path. That will give you divine light for your walk. That will keep you from sin and from compromise. That will enable you to really do everything enthusiastically with joy for the glory of God. Verse 17 also makes it clear that our words as well as our actions are in view when we do all for the glory of God. Whatsoever you do in word or deed. It also makes it clear that we have to be do everything with the authorization, with the authority of Jesus. It says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The word name speaks of authority, as in the phrase, open in the name of the law. And I've preached on that subject in the past, so I'm not going to go all over it again. But uh, doing things in the name of Jesus, you've got to be careful what you use the name of Jesus for. Uh, don't forge his name, especially in prayer. Jesus said in John 14, 13, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So here's an issue about bringing glory to the Father by using the name of Jesus. Now, I gave you several examples. How many of you remember the example of Mary praying about her friend that she's mad at? Nobody remembers that example. What, what was Mary praying about her friend? She was mad at her friend. She was praying that her friend would get what? Leprosy, right? Okay. Okay, suppose you have, I'm going to give you the illustration. I want you to remember this because it shows you the wrong way to use the name of Jesus. Now, Jesus just said in John 14, 13, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So that's got to be the result that the Father is glorified in the Son. When you ask this prayer, Scripture also tells us to ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. But if you just pull this verse out of context, so here was the example. I told you about a fight that you had with your friend Mary and that you're very mad at her, and so you pray, God, give Mary a horrible case of leprosy in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that is a blasphemous use of the name of Jesus because he didn't tell you to pray that Mary would get leprosy. And when he promised you that he would do whatever you ask in his name, it's also attached to the phrase that God may be glorified in it. You can't forge a check with a millionaire's name and expect not to go to jail. So when you do and say things in the name of Jesus, that means we are doing them and saying them with his authority, with his authorization, with his approval. And there are things that Jesus would say and do, and there are things that Jesus would not say and do. Because Jesus always did the will of his heavenly Father, and he said so. That's why everything he did and said brought glory to God alone. Just attaching his name is not a magic formula whereby you know, you're going to make something happen because you have used the name of Jesus like a magic incantation. That's witchcraft, folks. That has no part in the Christian life. Okay, so um, I'll go back for a minute to that resolution. I don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks. 
listen carefully, that does not mean that we are to isolate ourselves from other believers because we don't care what they think. Because you're not supposed to cause a weaker brother to stumble, for example. So you do have to pay attention what's going on in your relationship with other believers. You're supposed to be an example of the believers, Paul tells Timothy. And he lists a whole different group of things in which you're supposed to be an example. But instead, it informs us when you say, I don't care what other people think, I only care what Jesus thinks. It informs us of the kind of interaction with other people that pleases and therefore glorifies God. That's self-evident because in the next few verses here in Colossians chapter 3, it tells us how to glorify God in our interpersonal relationship. Now, I've read this to you before, so I'm not going to read it again because our time is limited. But read Colossians 3, verses 12 through the end of the chapter, down through verse 25. Because it puts it in the context of husbands and wives and children and parents and fathers and children and servants and masters. In other words, practical interpersonal relationships of life. And right dead in the middle of that, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in. And here we have music. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That smack dab in the middle of that passage that talks about doing all to the glory of God. You can't say, well, music doesn't fit this category. Uh, God never mentions that in relation. He mentions it right here. It's the heart of the passage in Colossians chapter 3, which talks about the way in which we interact with other people and how we do everything for the glory of God. Study it sometime. I encourage you to read that entire chapter. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 25. Now, I've also pointed out, and I hope you remember this, how many other of the nine facets of the fruit of the Spirit are mentioned in that Colossians chapter 3 passage about doing all to the glory of God. Did you know that when you're doing all to the glory of God, the fruit of the Spirit becomes manifest in your life? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are mentioned in Colossians chapter 3. We saw joy in the word hardly. We saw agape love and charity in verse 14. There's peace in verse 15. There's meekness and long-suffering in verse 12. You know, you go through that and you discover when you're walking by faith, when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're bringing glory to God, you will manifest the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is different from the gifts of the Spirit. You'll be manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. There are 21 different gifts, but there are are nine different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. You'll manifest the fruit of the Spirit. So in doing all to the glory of God covers every area of interpersonal relationships. The Bible gives us specific detailed actions, the specific detailed words, thoughts, motives, attitudes that God says are for His glory. There are instructions in Colossians 3 for interacting with other believers in the church, verse 13. For interaction between employers and employees, verse 22. For interaction between husbands and wives, children and parents, fathers in particular their children, verses 18 through 21. In other words, God has given us specific instructions and put music right in the middle of all that as to how we are to do all for the glory of God. We don't have to guess. We don't have to make it up. God wants us to give him all the glory, and so he has painstakingly set out the process for us step by step. In a nutshell, that's what's called living the Christian life. That's what's called walking in the Spirit. That's what's called walking by faith, or theologically, that's what's called progressive sanctification. It happens when we focus on doing, now listen carefully, doing every detail in a manner that is in conformity with the revealed will of God for the Christian life. And did you know God has given you his indwelling Holy Spirit so that you can do that? You don't have to just sort of generalize, shoot a shotgun pattern at it. Boing, I hope I hit something. He's given you detailed instructions because he wants you to be able to glorify him. And he has empowered you by the Spirit of God so that you can, in fact, bring him glory. Which is what, folks, we're going to be doing all through eternity. We might as well start learning how to do it now. Um, now, we can't go through that whole chapter, but... Another example of how our relationship with other believers glorifies God is seen in Romans 15, 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Christ received you when you were a, begins with S, sinner. Christ received us when we were sinners. And his patient kindness and loving grace drew us to him gave us faith 
and gave us life. When you interact with the rest of the world, do they see the grace of Christ in you as you seek to share the good news of salvation? Wherefore, receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So on one side of the coin, we see all of creation, especially believers, and we looked at those verses already, bringing glory to God. All of creation at the end in the book of Revelation bows down, falls before the throne, and gives worship and glory to God. On the opposite side of the coin, we see God manifesting his own glory. Giving glory to God or God manifesting his glory, those are the two sides of the same coin. Music displays a major facet of that truth because music is, for the most part, interpersonal. In other words, there are composers, there are performers, but there are also listeners. Among the listeners, there are responders who are motivated to a great extent by the music. Music is an external expression of the inner life manifested in a visible way and portrays deeply what we are like on the inside. In other words, music expresses what we believe about living the Christian life, walking in the spirit, walking by faith or progressive sanctification. The music we listen to and perform expresses audibly and visibly what we believe about doing every detail in a manner that is in conformity with the revealed will of God for the Christian life. It either manifests the glory of God or it does not. Now, I gave you a few illustrations, and we're going to add some more of those. We have a few more minutes. Uh, a few illustrations, and I want to give you a few more today about how God manifests his glory. First, we saw that God manifested his glory to Moses at the bush when he declared his covenant name. That was Exodus 3, 1 through 14. We've already read that. We're not going to read it again. But we saw that in John chapter 8, verses 54 through 59, Jesus referred back to that incident in Exodus 3, and he claimed to be the very God who spoke to Moses from the Shekinah glory at the burning bush. And they wanted to take up stones to stone him because they understood what he was saying. He's the one who spoke to Moses out of the bush, according to John chapter 8. Second thing we saw was God also manifested his glory to Isaiah in the throne room vision of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. I hope that we can study more about that when we begin our study of the book of Revelation in the evening service, which I'm not quite sure when that will exactly start because we still have a ways to go through the book of Acts. But when we begin that, did you know there's a throne room vision not just in Isaiah 6, but there's a throne room vision in Revelation chapter 4. And we see some incredible parallels between Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4 and what was going on back there in the Old Testament and what's going to be going on here in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible. I hope you can be with us for that study of Revelation. So just as the Shekinah glory of God connects Jesus to Abraham, that was the John 8 passage, even so the Shekinah glory of God connects Jesus to the magnificent vision of God's glory in Isaiah chapter 6. The Apostle John specifically says so in John 12, verses 38 through 41, where John told us that the glory of God seen in Isaiah 6 was actually the glory of Jesus. And John says so in John chapter 12, verses 38 through 41. Okay, now, so let's stop all, that's all exciting stuff. If you get me started on that, on the Shekinah glory, I'd love to preach on that particular subject. But uh, let's make an application of the principles uh, for music. Okay, so stop and think for just a minute. Does the music that you listen to and perform reflect this kind of glory? The glory you see at the burning bush in Exodus 3. The glory that you see in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And an angel has to come and take a tongs and take a coal off the altar and put it on his lips. Does the music you listen to and perform move you to worship a holy God who cannot tolerate sin? Revelation 4, the same thing we see there. That's why Paul can declare in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what's that last phrase? To the glory of God the Father. Folks, it's coming. 
There are many today who will not give God glory. Someday their knees will break and they will fall before the throne of Jesus and give glory to God. By the way, that uh, passage I just read out of Philippians, that's a quotation also from Isaiah. It's also cited in Romans as well as in Philippians. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 23 says, I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me, Jehovah speaking, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. And Paul says that applies to Jesus. Romans chapter 14, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. That's an important passage. Do you know the book of Isaiah? When was the last time you studied the book of Isaiah? Do you understand how many prophetic passages are in the book of Isaiah that point to the Lord Jesus Christ, that give us an incredible picture of his glory? You all know Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the lamb slain. Do you know all these incredible other prophecies and pictures of Jesus that Isaiah, written 850 years before he was born, gives to us of the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, people, do you know your Bibles? Do you know this all points to Jesus? Okay, so that brings us to new material for today. <laughs> I gave you a whole bunch of new material in that stuff that we were just covering there. But anyway, in the outline that I have done, uh, the new material. Third, the reasons that uh, God manifests or how God manifests his glory. Third, God also manifests his glory to John in the book of Revelation. Every chapter in Revelation, of course, manifests a different facet of the glory of God. The focus on the glory of God is not just the throne room version, which I mentioned a moment ago in chapter 4, but it's throughout Revelation. For example, Revelation 15, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was enter, able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled, which is a reflection back on that first temple of Solomon, which when it was dedicated, the glory of God filled the temple, and it drove even the priests out of the temple. They could not bear to minister in the presence of the glory of God. Revelation 21, verse 11, uh, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The heavenly Jerusalem is pictured there. Verse 23, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light there of God manifests his glory. Other ways in which God is glorified. Fourth, God is glorified when the word of God is glorified. Second Thessalonians 3, 1. I hope you're writing down some of these verses. These are different ways. God has told us how is he glorified. So if we want to apply it to music, let's learn the ways he says specifically that he is glorified. This is number four. God is glorified when the word of God is glorified. 2 Thessalonians 3.1 Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. So I ask you a question. Does the so-called Christian music you listen to glorify the Bible? Is it an appropriate setting for the eternal words of Scripture, or is it like using pornography to teach Bible memory verses? There's a lot of music out there that's like porn. They claim it's Christian because they got Bible verses attached. That's like using pornography to teach Bible verses. Fifth, God is glorified by creation. You all know this passage, Psalm 19.1. To the chief musician, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You know, one of the greatest oratorios of all time is uh, Franz Joseph Haydn's The Creation, the oratorio of the creation. Haydn lived from 1732 to 1809. He was one of the greatest composers of all time. He perfected the early symphonic form, invented the modern string quartet, was the principal founder of the Viennese classical school. The creation was first performed in April of 1798. Now, a lot of you, I'm sure, or I hope you do know, the musical composition called The Seasons by Vivaldi. But Haydn also wrote a beautiful work called The Seasons, which truly brings glory to God in the creation of the four seasons of the year. And he did it for the glory of God. In 1785, he wrote the seven words of the Savior on the cross and later added more vocal parts in 1796. Now, that's not the same as the one that I think most of you may be familiar with, Theodore Dubois' The Seven Last Words. The choirs here years and years ago performed Dubois' Seven Last Words and made a recording of it, and I passed out recordings of those of the Seven Last Words made by the choir of this church years and years and years and years ago. I appreciate the four ladies who are in our choir today, but that was a lot larger choir back in those days. <laughs> Filled the choir loft. They, they recorded the Seven Last Words of Christ. That's not the same one, but Haydn wrote one called uh, The Seven Words of the Savior on the Cross. 
And for those of you who are history buffs, and I give this by way of illustration to show how music can affect entire countries. In 1809, when Napoleon besieged Vienna and in May entered the city, Haydn, who was living in Vienna, refused to leave his house and to take refuge in the inner city. Napoleon placed a guard of honor outside of Haydn's house. And a few days before he died, the enfeebled composer was much touched by the visit of a French Hussars officer who sang Mit Verd und Hochheit, which is from the creation that Haydn wrote. A few days later, on May 31st, 1809, Haydn died. The music of that great Austrian reached England where they had begged him to stay to escape the ravages of the war in Europe. But it also reached the French who honored him even as they attacked his city. Friends, music makes an impact, especially when it is truly for the glory of God. Sixth, and I'll close with this one because I, I think I have 18 points, so we'll stop here at number six. Uh, the restoration of the nation Israel brings glory to God. The restoration of the nation Israel brings glory to God. Here we have the prophet Isaiah again. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 15. In fact, many passages out of different chapters. I'll just read one verse out of each. Uh, verse 15, thou hast increased the nation, O Lord, thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. He's glorified in the nation of Israel. Chapter 44, verse 23, sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains of forest and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. The work of God in Israel brings him glory. Isaiah 49, 3. And he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Isaiah 60, 21. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Who are the people? It's Israel whom he's talking about in that passage. Chapter 61. Next chapter, verse 3, to appoint them that mourn for in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The restoration of the nation of Israel brings God glory. May 1948. Israel became a nation born in a day. God is glorified. He brings them back in unbelief. He said he would do it. They're not coming back because they're trying to fulfill biblical prophecy. They're coming back because God is irresistibly drawing them from the four corners of the earth just like he promised. I wear this pin. It was Judy's favorite pin. We met on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. I love Israel. God has promises for Israel that he will yet fulfill. He is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. Well, our time is up. It's time for the communion service. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that all that we do might truly bring glory to Jesus Christ. Father, we don't deserve your kindness. We don't deserve your goodness. We don't deserve the blessings and the privilege that you have given to us. For by you have brought us into the promises and into the covenants and to the grace of God, which passes all understanding. Father, we thank you for you are good. You are our God. We fall before you and we worship you. Teach us to worship you as we should, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.